welcome to episode number 521 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. What have I got cooked up in the fish fry podcast pan for you this week? Well, I'm investigating the role of timing in SOSA applications with longtime friend of the show, Nigel Forrester from Concurrent Technologies. Nigel and I also discuss Assured Positioning, Navigation, and Timing, or APNT, for military applications, and why spoofing and jamming are critical challenges challenges to solve in this domain. Also, a little later on, I check out a new autonomous hybrid VTOL UAV developed by BAE Systems that can fold its wings and fit into a shipping container. Yes, really. (laughs) So without further ado, please welcome Nigel to Fish Fry. Hi, Nigel. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks very much for having me back. It's great to see you after a couple of years. It is. Okay, so first off, Nigel, give my audience a brief reminder. What is Concurrent Technologies all about? Okay, so at Concurrent Technologies, we pride ourselves for uh, all of our history, going back nearly 40 years now, in being a premier supplier of embedded computer boards based on Intel processor technology. That's what we've done since we were first uh, incarnated. And we've developed a number of different form factors of processor boards, largely angled towards the more critical embedded applications. And at this point in time, now 70% of our products go into the defense space, but we still supply a lot into telecoms test equipment, a bit into industrial automation, medical, high-speed physics, transportation, and other applications. You know, every time we introduce a board, some interesting customer comes along that we didn't envisage and yeah. uses it for something slightly different. But predominantly, we're focused on the defense space. Now, since we last met, we've um, enhanced our offering a little bit because we now offer a little bit more than just an Intel processor board and we, we've always had application enabling software around those products um, so we've expanded our portfolio a little bit more we're working a lot more with partners and we're we're at the um, not really the starting stages but we've developed a couple of deployable systems so for a long time we've had development systems that we've offered to get our customers started more quickly but we've we've um, enhanced that significantly with a view to uh, doing a lot more in the deployed systems because many of our customers are asking us now to deliver more than just a processor board. And if the processor board is a major part of that system, because several of these, you know, often get several processor boards in a system, sometimes the processor boards are mated to products from our other partners like uh, GPGPU boards or FPGA boards or switches, then that's something that we obviously can easily put together because we are fundamental to the technology part of it and we're building the rugged embedded solution around that by using products from, from other partners. Excellent. Okay, so at this year's Embedded Tech Trends, you talked a lot about the role of timing in SOSA applications. So why is timing so critical when it comes to these kinds of applications? Yeah, okay. So if I think about SOSA, the S in SOSA is for sensors, sensor open system architecture. And they're predominant, the types of applications that that they're trying to uh, achieve include things like radar, software-defined radio, ENOR systems. So these are all very angled towards high-speed signal processing applications. So typically you're bringing in information in either an RF um, format from sensors or in some cases now optical uh, fibers directly into either the box or the boards. And those uh, RF signals typically go into things like FPGA boards. Those FPGA boards split up 
the um, signal processing very often, uh, but they have very strict time periods where they have to do process a packet of information before moving on to the next packet of information and often they have to sort of split up the information spread it around the the processing resources and then uh, reassemble the um, the answers to make some meaningful intelligence out of it in order to do that they require very very precise timing so each of those boards in the system that are actually doing the signal processing have to be synchronized and by synchronized I mean absolute precision the, the, the higher the precision you can do that the, the, the more accurate the result is that you get out of the equations so in order to do that what SOSA have really driven is the that many of the backplanes that are al al aligned to the SOSA technical specification include what's called a timing slot and what happens is that from that timing slot you effectively get two signals out to each of the payload slots. One of those signals is, a, is an AUX clock and these are radial clock signals so they're separate signals to each payload. The AUX clock is a one pulse per second signal and then you also have what's called a ref clock signal and that ref clock signal is typically programmable from 10 to 100 megahertz and you can actually um, have different ref clock signals going to each payload card if you want it is programmable so by utilizing either the one PPS or the 100 megahertz or similar signal uh, higher speed uh, timing signal um, dependent on what you're trying to do with the system you can actually synchronize all of those cards and actually get the, the sort of result that you want so Nigel you also discussed the deployment of assured position navigation and timing or APNT so tell my audience about what all goes into an APNT solution yeah so on top of the timing aspect of these products there are applications where you also need position and navigation information so if you can imagine putting yourself in a very often land-based vehicle, you need to know where you're going and how you're going to get there. So in order to do that, the position navigation or the timing slot also has the ability to have an incoming RF connection from a GNSS satellite receiver. Uh, so there are many GNSS satellite constellations. The most well-known, the one that everybody thinks of, is GPS, the original American-led uh, satellite navigation uh, system. But there are many others, including Galileo from Europe and others. And so by taking in that information from a satellite, you can then not only synchronize your timing signals to an absolute reference, because within the GNSS packets, you get an absolute time. You also get a position and also a navigation. So where are you going? What speed are you doing? That, yeah. that type of information. So it allows you to then use that information in your application to determine where you're headed or other information about other things in the system. I was especially interested in two challenges in this arena, specifically spoofing and jamming. So can you talk to me about those a little bit? Yeah, so didn't really answer your last question very clearly either because I didn't talk about the assured part of the position, navigation and timing. So what I told you was that in normal working environment, we get a GNSS signal from a satellite constellation. In a jamming environment, that GNSS signal might disappear. And it's actually very easy to jam those GNSS signals because they're quite low power. And, and I'm sure everybody has experienced this, you know, if you've driven through a tunnel using your phone for navigational purposes or a sat-nav, then the, the signal disappears. And then, you know, your phone tries to give you an assured position and navigation based on some of the sensors in the phone. Now, what we're delivering is something very similar, but a little bit of a higher specification, where we have some additional sensors built into the timing, assured position navigation and timing board that actually extrapolate from the readings that they get from those sensors and then they still provide you with as accurate as possible position and navigation information on the same regular basis. So you'll know that the GNSS signal has gone away and there are electronics on the PNT position navigation and timing board to keep the timing 
going as accurately as possible and at the same time provide you with a if you like an interpreted position and navigation information and the concept of trying to keep that as the timing as accurate as possible is really really important because what you don't want to do is in a defense environment you may not just be driving through a tunnel you know your counterpart may actually be physically jamming the signal and that might last for a very long period of time I mean it's not unusual for that to be 24 hours or longer and so you've got to keep that timing as accurate as possible during that period and also extrapolate your navigation and timing information so jamming is relatively easy to envisage spoofing is a little bit more difficult because the idea there is that your counterpart will gradually move you to a position that you are not in by interfering with the GNSS signals and that is relatively easy to do because the GNSS signals are very low power signals so you don't need a particularly powerful transmitter to do that but you need a clever algorithm to to move you so if you can imagine you know you're driving in a in a military environment on a wheeled or tracked vehicle not on a road it's actually, you know, you might be in the middle of a field or similar. It's very easy for your enemy to actually move you or to think they've moved you 10 meters, 100 meters, a kilometer from where you are. And there's actually been several instances where this has happened where, for example, there's been ships that have appeared as though they're actually sailing in dry land because they've been moved to a position where they're not there. So you have to be able to detect that spoofing as quickly as possible and you have to be able to deal with it through that assured position and navigation and that's that's the clever bit of the, um, the sort of product that we've got that enables you to keep that information going for as long as possible and as accurate as possible. I love that stuff. All right, Nigel, let's look into your crystal ball. What does the future look like for concurrent technologies? Well, the past has been quite challenging because like everybody, we've had things like component shortages to deal with. And we've done a really good job of investing in buying components up front to try and actually manage that as best as possible. However, we've come into 2023 with a, you know, what for us is a, an incredible backlog of orders we've had a record year for sales in 2022 and obviously in 2023 we'll be looking to deliver that as much of that as possible and in addition we'll be looking to build on the capabilities both in terms of delivering some new and exciting board level products but doing a little bit more in terms of packaging those in some enclosures and boxes that our customers want to deploy so some interesting things coming up. I like it. Okay, so Nigel, let's talk about moving back into the office. Now, there has been a lot of struggle these days getting people back in there and happy. What have you guys been doing at Concurrent Technologies to help address this? Okay, so before I answer the direct question, let me give you the three values that we have at Concurrent Technologies. So the first one is to improve, evolve, and grow. And the second one is collaborate with candor. And the third one is to enjoy every day. So in order to attain those values, we've worked really hard over the lockdown period. Uh, we went from a situation where almost all our workforce were office based. We got to the situation where we have our own manufacturing production line. So and we were deemed an essential business. So we had to keep our production line running. So in order to protect those guys as best as possible, we moved everybody off site immediately. Now, that was a big challenge for some of the people because, you know, we've had we had guys who have been working for us for over 30 years who'd never worked from home and immediately had a dispatch from home. First of all, that was a real challenge, getting everybody onto Teams and trying to get them to communicate on a regular basis. So a lot more effort, I suppose, in actually getting people to work off site. Now, that has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. So if you're trying to collaborate with Canda and maybe you are trying to set up, you know, three, four, five way meeting, it's possible to do it online, but it's quite hard. It's also quite hard to get the human side. Um, you know, it's difficult to look people in the eye because, you know, camera might not be quite in the right place or you're not quite sure whether somebody's really listening to what you're saying. 
So in order to help our development process, and also very much where we've brought on a lot of new engineers in the last year, we've got a very vibrant you know, young workforce who need mentoring, then we've worked hard to try and bring as many people as possible back into the office. So we've done a number of things. We've completely refitted one of our two offices in the UK. We've got some bright colours. We've got a lovely working environment. It's not perhaps as exotic as some of the more high-tech companies. You know, it's a really nice place to go. It makes me smile when I walk in there. There's some really colourful little phone booths where you can go for a personal message. There's some teas and uh, there's plants. And it's sort of dragging people in to collaborate. So that collaboration with Candor is much easier to do there. In addition to that, we've done a lot on things like the mental health and well-being side both where people were working remotely, but also trying to bring them back into an office environment where we've done things like walking meetings. We've had um, some professional advice on how to break through some of those concerns people might have had about coming back into the office and socialising with people after a very long time. And the best thing we did in May 2022 was we actually organised a whole company event where everybody within the company, no matter where in the world they were based, was invited across for a two-day working event where we laid out what our strategy was from the top down. We had some great corporate team building uh, events, which were a load of fun. We got to socialize with people that none of us had met in our existence in the company. And we had some fun time. And so actually building back that family-friendly environment I think it's so important because you spend a lot of your time at work and if we're going to enjoy every day it's really important that you know how people work you know a bit about their character and their characteristics you know how to communicate better with them and that enables you to be a bit more specific in a way that you'd approach a problem and actually get a lot better results there are several other things we've done to try and sort of improve people's working life you know we've introduced flexible working we've got um, electric car scheme to try and encourage more environmentally friendly commuting into the office where we can several other you know small things that have made a little bit of difference Um, just one last example we've started to do what we call huddles in our engineering center of excellence where we actually gather around a coffee bar so it's a bit like a lunch and learn but without the lunch usually where somebody will give a 10 minute talk on what they're doing and what their challenges are and why you know they've done what they've done and things like that so that that we can get a little bit more insight in the company about what everybody's function does some really good things going on you know i'd like to think that we're really trying to live those values Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me yet again, Nigel. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure and I'll look forward to speaking again if I get the opportunity. Thank you, Amelia. Keeping with our military theme this week, have you seen the new foldable autonomous hybrid VTOL UAV developed by BAE Systems? Okay, so this vertical takeoff and landing aircraft developed in Australia called the Strix can carry over 300 pounds of payload for over 500 miles and can fold up and fit into a shipping container. Crazy, right? Okay, so this straight out of Star Wars VTOL was recently unveiled at Australia's Avalon Air Show. It can be landed and launched vertically without any kind of runway. At rest, it can actually stand straight up on its back wheels under the power of the propeller and then lift off and land just on its rear wheels, like tail sitter aircrafts can. And the wings can fold. So when you have the propellers at the right direction, this UAV can actually fold down into 8.5 feet by 14.8 feet, making it super easy to roll right onto a shipping container and then right out onto a truck. 
So the Strix can run autonomously, being controlled by BAE's Strix Vehicle Management System. It can also be run from a station on the ground, or it can be controlled from on board a helicopter. Now, in the case of the helicopter control, the idea here is that it could possibly protect an air crew in a high threat environment. Another cool part of the Strix is its hybrid power system, which allows it to carry a variety of different mission-specific payloads and gives it that long range I spoke of earlier. So how far are we from Strix making it to prime time? Well, closer than not. BAE Systems Australia says that the Strix could be ready for operational service as soon as 2026. You guys, I have included a link to a video of the Strix in action in the YouTube description and on this week's Fish Frying page on EE Journal. You have to check out this thing for yourself. It is super cool. And it is definitely giving me all sorts of Star Wars vibes. <laughs> hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, folks, youtube.com slash EE Journal. It is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's fish frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of March 3rd, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton and you've been fried. <laughs>